Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am so excited to have with me today Tobias Rauscher. And I told him I am German, part part German. My maiden name was Jaeger. So I was going to try to say it the real German way. I think I did okay. <laughs> Absolutely. You did pretty well. Pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, so I always love to start with just kind of your background. Um, you know, how did you get involved in music? How long have you been in music? How, how did you get involved in music? And how did you start on YouTube? Because that's going to be a big conversation we have today. And I know that's kind of why you got your start online. So um, I know that's a, a big thing to unpack, but I love to hear people's stories. So I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, so I started playing the guitar when I was 14 and I was totally into rock, you know, Linkin Park and all that era. And then I, yeah, we started our first band. Uh, I would say we were pretty good. Like our vocals weren't, yeah, we were kind of uh, tricky, but it's like, it was a lot of fun. And then at some point it got more serious. We pitched to labels and all that stuff. Uh, and really we did pretty much yeah, we made all the mistakes <laughs> so many independent musicians do all the time. So we don't, did everything wrong. Uh, wrong. We like we you know, we invested like over ten grand in our first debut album. Like we spent one year in the studio, not releasing anything. It was always like keep it secret, keep it secret. Then there was this big launch, and guess what? Like nobody cared. <laughs> like it was, we sold like a couple of albums, you know, and it was like wow, that's it. Okay, well, everyone was disappointed. And at some point, I then kind of started, uh, yeah, I was like, okay, we actually split. It was like a kind of game over, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, and then I started working in the music industry at Warner Music Germany at some point to really, yeah, learn how the music industry really works. And this is where I really learned that you have to have a strategic approach. You have to have a framework and all that stuff. And at that time, I focused more and more on percussive finger style. I can't sing, so I can just smack my guitar and do tapping and all that stuff. And then with that knowledge, I kind of like tried to focus on my music again. Now, uh, like, a, yeah, a solo instrumental artist. And yeah, that really worked once I really focused on marketing, like proper music marketing. And I focused on YouTube strategies as well. And I got a lot of success with that, over 50 million views by now. And this kind of opened up a complete different world. All of a sudden, you know, people from different countries approaching you to play gigs, booking you and all that stuff. So this was kind of in a nutshell how it all started uh, with my uh, career as a musician. I played shows in China, Taiwan, uh, the US as well. So it was like a crazy ride. And at some point then, yeah, I started to help artists as well. Like in the beginning, it was like friends of mine approaching me like, hey, do you have some tips on how to, you know, get you get my music out there and how to market myself. And then I kind of focus on really mentoring artists. So this is, uh, yeah, until I founded Famous Pro where we help artists as well. So this is in a nutshell, the entire journey. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's how a lot of us get started. That's certainly how I got started and, you know, doing, doing my own freelance stuff and then people seeing me and saying, how are you doing that? That kind of thing. And then you start helping artists, which is great because, you know, then you've got that background. It's not like you just, you know, came up with some formula that you didn't actually apply and, you know, you're trying to help people when you don't have the experience. So that is, that is perfect. I'm curious along the way, like, were you doing other jobs? Like, were you doing music full time or did you have like part time gigs or, you know, you were moonlighting or whatever while you were working on your music? Yeah, in the beginning it was like school and studying <laughs> pretty ah. much. So I was kind of like, yeah, part time musician. And then uh, Warner Music was full time and I had some jobs beside before that. 
uh, like just some like work at the airport <laughs> in Germany and stuff like this. So it was always like mainly focusing on music, having some psychics, then working full time. And then I was like, no, I, I, let's try one more time with my music. And then I basically went all in on that more or less. Yeah. I think it's good to hear that because uh, artists sometimes feel like, oh, I'm not legit unless I'm doing this full time. Um, and, you know, no. everybody that's eventually become full time has had those periods, like you said, where it's like, oh, I'm doing this on the, I'm working at the airport, you know, and then you like then you go, oh, maybe just the, the answer to my life is a full time job. And you do that and you go, no, like I'm not fulfilling my passion in music. And, you know, so I just want to encourage everyone that's listening or watching like you got to figure it out. Like it's not, it's not a straight path. Right. No, and there are going to be ups and downs and, and you yeah. may like have a period of time where you decide to go to a full-time job to like save a bunch of money. So then you can go into music more full-time. And I mean, even with a full-time job, I mean, you're still like the entire evening uh -huh. <laughs> to focus on your music. I mean, it's your choice watching TV or Focusing on a music career, you know, it's like if you spend just two hours each and every day, that's that's still plenty of time, and that adds up even if you are, have a full time uh, job. So it's it's still manageable, and uh, it's always a thing of your priorities. You know, what do you do in your free time then? You know, focus on your music, maybe. <laughs> yep. No, and I always say like, you know, podcasts are a great way to keep yourself in the loop of what's going on in the industry. And you can listen to them if you're commuting to work and stuff like that. So that's why I think yeah. those are so great. Okay. So let's jump into YouTube because what I love about what you do is that you focus specifically on musicians. There's been a, you know, a lot of YouTubers out there that are helping us understand the algorithm and know how to title and all that stuff. Uh, and I've taken YouTube courses but I have not seen many YouTube courses that are specifically for musicians. And I do think YouTube is different for musicians because your content is different. It's not all how-to kind of content that we all know does really well on YouTube. So first of all, you know, what did you find? What really stuck for you that helped you get those millions of views on YouTube when you first started as a musician? Yeah, so the first thing that I really uh, understood kind of quickly was that YouTube works differently than or compared to all other social media networks because like on Instagram, on Facebook, you know, you always, TikTok, you're always kind of forced to constantly create noise, post every day, no, five times per day, you know, just post every minute, like, and it's just like so many musicians are just overwhelmed and it's just like, what should I create? You know, I maybe just have like my 12 songs or maybe my five songs or whatsoever and all two music videos, you know, you cannot just produce content all the time. And YouTube is kind of, it works with artists in a different way. They are a partnership. They're like, hey, you got a great music video. Well, let's split the revenue and we promote it for you. We show it to new people who've never heard of you, you know, and while we're talking right now people are still watching for example my videos that i uploaded 10 years or 12 years ago and this is the power of youtube stuff i uploaded 10 years ago on instagram or facebook like <laughs> it's it's dead oh, yeah. <laughs> it's gone and so this is so powerful because youtube really helps you to introduce your music to new fans who are highly likely to watch your music because they suggest your video to other people, billions of people around the world and so this is where i was like okay this is a real powerhouse especially when it comes to musicians you find out about new musicians on youtube and all that stuff and so this is i think a really underrated tool because most People just want to hop on the latest trends on TikTok or whatsoever, you know, but it's like, hey, YouTube is a long term growth machine. It's really powerful, but focus on it and definitely don't neglect it. So, uh, yeah, and this was when I kind of uh, yeah, really um, saw my first success over there as well and really noticed the power of YouTube recommending you basically an autopilot. Even I mean, I uploaded probably between three to five videos per year, <laughs> per year. And I still got over 50 million views, like sometimes 10 to 20,000 people watch my videos each and every day. And sometimes I don't upload for half a year or longer. So, and this is the insane power and uh, why we musicians should definitely leverage this. I mean, I got invited to play in China and all that just because of my performance and my, like my presence on YouTube. So it's, it's, it's really, YouTube is a powerhouse and uh, I cannot stress that uh, enough. 
That's kind of amazing. Uh, so let's talk about music discovery on YouTube, because for me, I don't go seeking out music on YouTube. That's just me. Maybe it's my generation. Yeah. Um, I go on Spotify, right? And Spotify is recommending stuff to me and I do discover new musicians there. And I'm assuming the algorithm is kind of similar. Do you really, is there a huge group of people that are out there wanting to find new musicians through music videos? The beautiful thing is that People don't go there actively, but it happens by accident because they're on YouTube. And the funny thing is, YouTube is an 80% male domain for whatever reason. I don't know why. And so maybe, for example, my uh, audience is as well predominantly male because I, I don't, because I mean it's pretty technical. It's I don't sing maybe because they're guitarists. I don't know, but it's just a fact I found out. And so this is. Uh, but even when you just if you use YouTube, you know, the algorithm is so intelligent and so smart. They know the, the algorithm really knows who you are, what are your preferences, what are you interested in, because they always measure the watch time. So if I watch a video about a uh, on a I don't know, I watch a Metallica concert right now and I watch it for over half an hour, YouTube directly knows, oh wait, that's a lot of watch time for Metallica. Let's you know, show him Iron Maiden, Pantera, whatsoever. So, and I totally go down this route um, in, in into that. So yeah, it's basically YouTube actively uh, promotes stuff. Even if I'm li listening or not listening, like watching two completely different videos, all of a sudden, like still bands pop up, you know, that I, for example, when I listened to music a month ago, it's still like trying to give me the optimal mix of uh, content. So this is um, really great. Oh, and one benefit I really forgot is that each you have channel clusters. So each country and each region has its own channel cluster. For example, what I found out a really powerful strategy, by the way, is um, I contacted some people in Thailand. Or first, I found out uh, about the strategy because people just ripped my video, uploaded it on a Thai channel for example, and it got 6 million views in like a couple of months. And I was like, what is going on there? In the beginning, I was like, hey, take it down. And then I was like, wait, wait, all the comments were Thai and the title of the video was in Thai as well. It was like, it's saying something like guitar God. <laughs> of course, oh. I would never <laughs> call myself that, but I was like, huh. It's it's like it's a like nice pre-framing in Thai. And so I really got popular in Thailand because I would have never seen it because everything is in Thai. The description, the comments, it's just like your own channel cluster. And so you can really tap into these markets. And then I started to really actively ask people to upload my video, for example, in Thailand. And you have the same in Germany, you have it in Brazil, you have it in every country. And this is so powerful. It's so, so powerful because um, I have a strategy going global to really tap into these emerging markets because they share, I think, around three to five times more than the Western countries. They spend more time uh, online, more time on mobile. Uh, so it's much easier to get gigs over there to really become kind of even famous over there. And then you get a lot of social proof, a lot of views, a lot of likes, and then you can promote it in your own countries. And it just like, it just blows up. So there are many strategies um, that you can get yeah, tap into. <laughs> oh, that is pretty interesting. So you're giving them permission to take your video and are you how are you able to like link that back to your channel so they know who you are yeah so i always um firstly started writing something in the video like a watermark so they know my channel and website and i of course ask them to mention my name there and link to my video in the description um and you can even nowadays with content id just monetize it so you get uh, a chunk of the money as well but it's like a really really powerful uh, promotional tool on youtube that pretty much not a lot of people are using. Got it. So they can, as long as they put your content ID in there, you're still going to get actually the monetization from that. Yes, I, I can monetize these videos. That's as well. very yeah. cool. Wow. So my question is about your own channel. Um, as far as getting kind of getting over that hump of the watch time, right? Like for me, I have never been able to monetize. I don't focus on YouTube, so I'm not yeah. upset about it, but I've never been able to monetize because I can't get past the number of watch hours that you need per year. How do you kind of just ramp that up from the beginning? Yeah. In the beginning, that in the beginning, it's really, really difficult because you don't have the data. So the algorithms analyze, you know, for example, how much watch time you have, how much is the engagement. So because this is the only way YouTube's algorithm can really measure how good your music is. It's just based on data. 
if you don't have data, it cannot measure and it cannot recommend because only if YouTube says that the KPIs, the key performance indicators like watch time, you know, interaction, audience retention is good, only then YouTube starts to recommend your video to other people on autopilot. But for that, you need this data. So in the beginning, it's really important to jumpstart kind of your views. And this, uh, well, there are different strategies for that. Of course, on one hand, you could use paid advertising. Back then, what I did was I covered, for example, uh, some small smaller artists that I could connect uh, connect to directly and uh, made a cover video or for example, their song and then send it to them, you know, and then usually ask them to maybe like, you know, share it or something. And then kind of they send uh, me traffic uh, that way. So it's advertising. It's like some growth strategies, for example, working with aggregation sites. Sometimes you can just for buy for 50 bucks, for example, that they promote your uh, new music video link. So you need to kind of get a like a spike in traffic or maybe if you have your own channels or, and you sh should have of course for example then just make a launch like a video launch prepare it three days at least before you know make some buzz and then send all the people to your youtube channel and it also helps if you go live for example and then you need a lot of views and it doesn't mean like ten thousands it can be just a couple of hundred views but you need this kind of data for the algorithm to start like learning and then you know picking it up and then it, you have the chance to uh get recommended of course your content needs to be good and it needs to be optimized you know talking about tagging and title strategy and all that stuff and there are some nitty-gritty uh, uh things that you can do um, but in the beginning, I usually recommend to get some kind of push, you know, to to get going like a little jump start that definitely helps instead of just posting content if you have zero subscribers. Yeah, for sure. You just got to get that got to get that launch push right for anything that we launch, like a release or anything. Yeah. So what what about what about advertising? Are you talking about YouTube advertising, like native advertising within YouTube? Yeah. Or do you actually use like Facebook and Instagram to send people there? Now, we tried uh, Facebook and Instagram as well. There are ways to do it if you embed the video on a landing page, for example, or your own website, let's say. But Facebook and Instagram are kind of, or Meta, are competitors <laughs> to yep. Google and YouTube. So sometimes if you post a video, a YouTube video on uh, Facebook right away, it's just like... It, it doesn't get any interaction. It's just crazy. So yeah, I would either embed it usually or just send people then when it comes to ads, definitely it's uh, Google AdWords. So uh, yeah, basically YouTube ads. Yeah, that makes sense. And you know, you can advertise on other people's channels, right? That have similar music. Yes, that's a great thing. So you can select, for example, hey, my music is similar to, I, I don't know, uh, Tommy Emmanuel or John Gom or Andy McKay. So I can, you know, put my video as an ad in front of their best performing videos. So this is really powerful. You know, if you're similar to Ed Sheeran or Taylor Swift, I don't know, you know, you can just select her or his best tunes videos and just place your music in front of it because people who watch this are highly likely to like your music as well. Sometimes they don't even know that it's an ad and they're like, oh, cool, what's that? And then they save you and blah, 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 follow you and all that stuff. So there are different ways. Um, yeah, so, so YouTube is really, uh, really actually a good tool for that. Yeah, I love that. So as far as content for musicians on YouTube, we talked about music videos. Is there other type of content that you suggest that musicians mix in there into their channel? Yes, definitely. So if uh, ideally you have a really well-prepared content marketing strategy, of course, it consists of our own tunes, but it can be also like teasers or snippets, like my favorite solo section whatsoever. So just think creatively as well, how you can repurpose um, um, content. And what I noticed is, uh, well, like uh, one, one, if some, a, a video performs well or goes viral, it when it goes viral a second time as well. I, for example, just re-recorded a song, called it Memory Version 2, <laughs> and just uploaded it again, just a different setting. And once again, <laughs> millions of views are still awake. Like I can just re-record it and it works again. It work, It's just like crazy. And uh, so this is of course your music uh, stuff, but then it, I would say it always depends on your audience. So this is why it's so important to do some audience uh, research 
Um, so don't just think about, hey, what do I want to publish? It's about, okay, who is my audience and what does my audience like? For example, I know just early on that a lot of my uh, audience or fans are guitarists themselves. So I started publishing, for example, guitar tutorials where I show how to play like this kind of, uh, yeah, <laughs> percussive finger style, you know, and stuff that works really well is if you kind of include yeah, kind of uh, viral elements to it, you know? Or can you just, let's first start about emotional content. If you, let's say you're a singer-songwriter, just go somewhere in a park, like in Berlin or in New York or whatsoever, or in a subway and just busk around. People will come around you, you know, you can have a camera guy filming their faces because it's all about emotions. And all of a sudden it's the same song, but just in a different setting and all of a sudden, oh, people stop and they look, you know, and then you include something like this. This is always um, what's really good. Or if you do something unexpected, because uh, one artist, uh, I think it's, I forget his name, like bucket drummer or something. And he basically has paint buckets. He's just like, he's a drummer and he's just on the street and it's crazy. It sounds so great, but just like a few buckets and it's just like he plays he totally rocks it and then all the people are standing there filming and that's emotional that's like cool it's never seen so think about how can you incorporate for example when i play the guitar i could use this glass and play slide guitar you know that's like oh now you use it, do something that that's not normal you know something that, that's kind of interesting or maybe mix something play an old tune of your in a metal or jazz version or maybe the verse is metal and the chorus is jazz or something like something which is just like interesting and that's like catchy. Um, so that's like, so think about content that just kind of entices people to watch it. And then of course, what always works and this is really good when you're just starting out, of course, covering stuff. Like let's say, once again, Ed Sheeran releases his new tune or music video and then everyone is searching for that. Now you, of course, want to pick up, you want to surf this wave. So same title, same keywords, like uh, Ed Sheeran, you know, whatever the new song is, you know, put the keywords in the description, use it as, as tags, use the same tags, for example, Ed Sheeran uses and all that stuff. So there are some hacks that you can use. And then you, uh, you, you are likely to getting clicks from people who are just actively searching to watch his music video in that case. And then the twist is if you don't just cover it, but kind of make it your own, for example, and once again, Ed Sheeran jazz version, or I know, um, like again, I, I love uh, heavier music as well. There's some really heavy acts out there. And then you have some covers, acoustic covers mm -hmm. with a female led, uh, like a female vocals, beautiful. So you hear like a slip or whatever, like a really heavy song, but all of a sudden completely different vibe. And so this is stuff that works so well on YouTube. So don't be afraid to kind of venture out and find um, you know, interesting content that ideally really is interesting for your audience. And of course, there's a lot of more tutorials and uh, Q and A's behind the scenes, you know, behind uh, like when you go on tour, for example, you can do like a, a tour, I don't know, uh, insider uh, behind the scenes section right. whatsoever. Inside the green so, room or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. What do you think about shorts? Do you utilize shorts in your strategy? Yes, yes. It's like shorts are really, really powerful. So we are working with some artists. Uh, for example, uh, we worked with Clunk Phonics, great band, check them out. It's like a electronic trio, but they, for example, include a vacuum cleaner. Uh, is it a vacuum cleaner or something like this? Uh, I don't know how it's called, but in their music, it's amazing. They are making amazing music and their shorts are killing it. They are, it's just like they, they, they kind of really boosted the entire channel. So shorts are really a powerhouse because YouTube kind of, kind of um, yeah, gives them kind of extra attention. So, and it's easy to create shorts, you know, they don't need to be perfect. They don't need to be polished, you know, just record like a 30 second video whatsoever and do a couple of tries, use a good hook, use something catchy. And then it's like TikTok pretty much. I mean, YouTube is Everyone is kind of trying, you know, copy to copy uh, TikTok, like Instagram is doing it, uh, YouTube in a well, in a way as well, short short form content, and so publish it on TikTok, publish it on Instagram Reels, publish it on uh, YouTube Shorts. So it's as well a really good strategy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So if you've got those, you make them for shorts already, obviously you can easily post them on those other channels. What yeah. what are the goals of those other channels? Are Do you kind of say YouTube is my main thing and the goals of those other channels are to send people to YouTube or are you just kind of building a fan base on each of those separately? So uh, first of all, you don't need to be on all channels. That's like uh, what a lot of artists Thing, but you don't have to and usually find one channel that really works well for you for example and double down become really good at this one channel and then always i say the goal is to get the people in your own system because you need to own your fan base get them on your email list get them on your messenger list this is where the money is made because i mean if you look at the um what's called the um the the not the retention the the reach the reach for example on facebook on instagram like it's always declining it's like inflation <laughs> just on steroids it's going down it's going down like it's it's just like crazy back then when i had like 5000 followers on facebook I, my posts were getting over a thousand view, likes and all that stuff. Then I approached like 70, 80,000 and all of a sudden, like, you know, just a couple of hundred, like, well, see my, and so and I was like, what's going on? And then Facebook was always asking you to boost. Yeah. Give us money to reach. But I was like, wait, that's kind of weird. I tried to get all my people on my Facebook channel and now you are kind of, you know, denying me access and asking me to pay for them because Facebook owns my fans. And so always get the people in your own system. This is the most important thing, Bill your email list of course and then when you launch something you can send all your people from your email list as well to your new YouTube, uh, youtube launch product launch or whatever you have over there and of course you can send them to different platforms to kind of send them to instagram and tiktok but again like uh, have a channel that works for you and then uh, really double down yeah i totally agree with that get them on your own you know your own email list like, uh, you know, you got to own, you got to own your fans, right? You got to be able to, who knows if they're going to take down any of those platforms, even YouTube, right? So we know yes, that, yeah. sure that, that we know how to contact them and we, we have that platform, you know, in our own possession. So what, what are the best ways that you've found to get people off of YouTube and the other channels and onto your email list? So what I did to get the people, for example, off YouTube is that in pretty much every description, I basically offer something for free, like a free masterclass, like back then, like a free uh, tutorial or free tabs, you know, because again, my audience wanted to learn how to play my songs. So I offer them free tabs, for example, and you can make these um, kind of notations and info postings, however you call it, inside the, inside the video. So for example, at minute i don't know 120 you know like a little call to action pops up like hey uh want to get my guitar book for free you know and then you can click on it and you get people off of youtube or you include direct call to actions for example inside the video at the end you're like hey thank you so much for watching my video you know if you want to get my whatever you know click on the link below this video and then I i'm going to send it to you so this is like Typically, like use call to actions in your videos, in your video description, uh, in your community tab or in your shorts. This is how you can get the people off of uh, YouTube. But always keep in mind, and it's, that's always like the tricky thing. Of course, no social media platforms likes it when you get people off the platform, <laughs> because ideally they should keep on watching videos collecting watch time, you know, uh, but that's always, always a uh, little, little trade-off, but still I recommend to do it and try, of course, to get people down there because when you monetize, the real monetization happens on your email list, usually by ads and email lists. And so you need to get people on your email list. It's really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. So once people are on your email list, what are the monetization strategies that you recommend for artists? Yeah, so first of all, I would say uh, why you should get emails, why you get, get people into your own system is to build a deeper relationship. So to turn a listener into like a super fan, someone who really creates a bond, you can send them, for example, personal stuff from you, like tell some stories where you really messed up, you know, where the world collapsed on you when you... 
you know, whatever interesting stories you have, and they can be really personal. And this is like, like in a real relationship, we need to build this relationship, send some valuable emails, you know, give them some cool stuff so that they're looking forward to your emails. And then I usually uh, um, recommend to include some kind of low LTO, low ticket offer, you know, like a free plus shipping offer, something like this, where you're like, hey, for example, I had this with my own guitar book. You're like, hey, do you want to get my guitar book? You know, just uh, cover uh, shipping. And then you can basically offer them something as an upsell, like an order bomb. You know, hey, if you want to get, for example, backstage access to all the lessons in the book, or I walk you through it, you know, for 19 or 29 bucks, you can add it. And so you, you turn a listener into a buyer. So if it's just like seven bucks or nine bucks or 10 bucks, that's a world that's so, so important to turn a listener into a buyer. And then of course, there's so many strategies depending on your audience again. And this is what I see, uh, yeah, many artists kind of uh, do wrongly again. They think about what they want to sell instead of what their audience wants, for example. And it can be something different. You know, you don't always have to sell sh shirts or caps and something like this. So it's more about, hey, maybe you're, I don't know, you're a Gothic artist, metal band, whatsoever. And you notice, hey, my audience loves candles. Hey, maybe sell candles to them with your logo or some your own collection. So always think creatively of, okay, who are my audience or who is my audience and what does my audience really like? Do they have problems? Do they have desires? Or it can be custom songs, you know, it can be a retreat, a week long retreat or a retreat like a, or a guitar boot camp in Italy or whatsoever. So always think about, hey, what kind of value can I provide? And then it's about like having a good launch funnel, you know, a good product launch strategy to kind of get people in your world. And then there's like, oh, you have a fan membership site for, I don't know, nine or 10 bucks per month, where you really take your fans backstage with you. They get VIP tickets. They, 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 you have a live stream during rehearsals. You send them unpublished songs. They can decide on song names whatsoever. So it's like, just be creative, but always think about who, who is my ideal, my fan avatar, who's my ideal super fan and what do they really uh, want to have? And then this is how monetization works. And of course, Ideally, you combine that with paid advertising, because of course, if you have people on your email list, they are much more worth than a follower on YouTube or on Instagram or whatsoever. And then we can use lookalike audiences and tell basically Facebook and Instagram, hey, look, these are people who even bought from me. They love my music. So go and get more of these kind of people. And then the algorithm gets better and better and better and better and really keeps sending you people who really love your music and not only love music, but they who also buy from you and all that stuff. So it's then like the, the typical online marketing, like marketing strategies to really grow your fan base. And the great thing is when you spend money on ads, even if it's for a product, you grow your fan base on the site. So it's always like the, the benefit we have. And um, yeah, so that's in a nutshell how I would recommend to do it. Yeah, I think a lot of song, singer songwriters, they get stuck in their head or even bands because they, you know, they don't have, like you said, a guitar book or like tutorials or things like that, that they can sell that aren't physical products. So they think all I can sell is merch. And, mm. you know, we I talk about custom songs as well. That's definitely one thing they can sell. but. I think they get stuck in like, what can I sell that has value, but doesn't cost me any money, right? Because it's like my time or my expertise yeah. or whatever. Uh, do you have anything that you've seen that works that's not necessarily around teaching? Yeah. So once again, like I think di anything digital is the best you can sell because anything else you sell, like when I was shipping out my guitar book, like <laughs> it's work, it's work. It's like you said, then it doesn't arrive. You send it to Taiwan and then it doesn't arrive and you're like, oh, or it gets sent back, you know, it's like, it's crazy. So it's like, it, it's a complete different e-commerce business then. So I always recommend if you have something, it's like I said, for example, a membership, you know, where you kind of have something digital, digital, they kind of buy access and get something digital from you, like early access, or it can be backstage passes, you know, or um, uh, I know a band from the US, they sell, for example, high ticket items. It's just the tour experience for eight grand. They just sell it to 10 people and they go with them on tour for, I think, one or two weeks. They 
go for dinner with them. They go backstage with them. They they experience the entire tour. They pay eight grand and they make 80 grand before playing a single note. So this is something, for example, crazy, you know, of course, wedding gigs, booking gigs is of course, featurings, you know, that you play the guitar on someone else's uh, record or that you sing production. So it, but once again, it's really about your audience. Mm, so this is why I always think it's like, don't really, Think necessarily about what you want to sell or can sell. First, get to know your audience, survey them, hop on a phone or on a Zoom call with them and really learn what they really want. And it might be, for example, we have one client who is um, really good. Like it's more like, um, yeah, really well, it's a, like a um, university professor and he does a lot with words, like a little bit rap, but not typical rap. It's just like spoke, spoken word and really smart stuff. And it's like, uh, yeah, poetry pretty much. Mm. And he is also in this kind of, his audience is in this kind of more spiritual realm, you know? And for example, he helps them with breath work, you know, meditation and all that stuff. So he kind of ventures in it because he noticed, hey, all my fans are in this kind of market as well. And then it's about find things that they want through uh, uh, from you. It doesn't always have to be a music. So this is what I always think um, has still the biggest uh, potential that you do something like this. And um, yeah, but it all starts with your audience uh, finding out who they really are. Yeah. Oh, I love those. You had some really great ideas in there. So I hope people won't, might want to just rewind a little bit and listen to those again, because <laughs> some of those were really golden. Um, what do you like for a membership platform? Like, do you recommend P Patreon or trying to build your own or? Mm -hmm. I think nowadays it's become extremely easy to set up your own uh, platform. And to be honest, it's like there are so many ways lead to Rome. Like you get it. Like it's, it's, it's just, <laughs> it's just so many stuff out there and it depends on how tech savvy you are for example i'm a big wordpress fan because it's pretty much super low cost it's super powerful you could can do anything with that and uh, i'm a big fan of thrive uh, themes as well you have a membership area costs everything you need for that um i know some people use click funnels or uh, Kajabi, uh, but these are more pricey. I mean, you pay at least a uh, hundred bucks per month or school. Um, so, but if you don't want to have, if you don't know anything about WordPress or something like this, this might be easier, but it might be costly in the long term. So Patreon is a good way to start, I would say. So it's easy to use. You can just create an account, you know, start selling. But once you reach a certain threshold, I usually recommend to set up your own page, your own system again. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I really, really like a WordPress. <laughs> That's cool. No, and I've seen people use Mighty Networks. Like there's a lot of different mm. opportunities. Yes. Some people are like, you know, they do a Facebook group and then they just charge people for entry on PayPal. Like you can, you know, you can go super like, yeah. like easy, simple and just yes. cobbling things together in the beginning until you get exactly, like a threshold yes. of people. Right. I like Absolutely. That. And that makes sense to start and test the market. That's what I always mm -hmm. say as well. You know, don't spend one year developing something crazy, launch it, just to see nobody cares about it, like we did with our first right. album pretty much. And this, I think the biggest mistake a lot of startup founders do as well. They just build something, have developers work for it for one year, get venture funding, you know, and then they launch it and they notice, oh, there's a product market fit. It's the, the platform is perfect, designed well, everything works, but nobody really wants to use it. And the same with that test. If people really want to buy something from you, maybe, yeah, like you do, like do weekly live calls via Zoom, for example, uh, Facebook group, you know, and then you say, hey, it works. I got my first 10 or 20 customers. And then you kind of, you know, go from there. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. There's no reason to to put all that money up front. And don't all of us have one of those stories of you know, investing and keeping it secret and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. And then we launch it. That's why it's so important to have the pre-launch and to really be yes. even like bringing people along, like, Hey, I'm creating this thing, like getting people excited about it. 
Yes, yes. Otherwise, it can hurt because yes. you put so much work in it to make everything perfect. And sometimes it's our fear of the launch. So we procrastinate and it's like, no, it's not perfect yet. No, 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 not yet, not yet. And then it gets worse and worse once you launch because then you, it's, you're it's you going to be disappointed. So start yeah. early sharing it, get people in, you know, and then they, usually you will have even more success with it. Yeah, absolutely. We can use tinkering as a reason not to launch, right? No, I just need to fix this. I need to fix that because it's scary. Oh, yeah. Like you put yourself out there and what if what if nobody buys? I always say you're the only one that knows if nobody buys. It's not like, <laughs> you know, there's a you know, there's a letter on your chest that like has a big X on it because nobody bought. Like nobody knows except you. True. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not fun, right? But like, you know, if you get used to that feeling, then you can test things and not be so scared. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, is there anything we've covered a lot today? Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you think people need to know, especially about YouTube and how musicians can use that to build their, their fan base? Oh, there's so many things like, um, but I think we covered a lot of the important fundamentals. Like, I mean, optimization, one thing it's, um, um, yeah, what it's really underrated or not really focused on is uh, the click-through rate, the importance of the click-through rate. And so it's like, you always have to think that you're competing with all the other videos around you. If you go to YouTube right now, you probably see 10 or 20 videos. Which one do you click on and why? Why did you click on that one? Because this video won the click and you wanna be that video. So your thumbnail and your title is so extremely important. If you don't get these two things right, it's like it hinders your success. For example, one good book I uh, I can highly recommend this is when I how I started uh, uh, venturing in entrepreneurship. It's the Four Hour Work Week by Timothy Ferris. And look, the stuff in the book it's good. It's great. It's a great book, but it's not that revolutionary. But the title. This is why everyone wanted to read it. So you have to sell your content by having a good title, a good hook. And so this is the same principle. You need to trigger curiosity and win the click to show people your content. And for example, huge uh, yeah, YouTubers like Mr. Beast, they spent $10,000 to test a thumbnail and create a thumbnail. They do split testing. And this is what we recommend as well. At least create three to four thumbnails and just run a for 10 bucks a advertising campaign on Facebook, do a split test and check the, uh, the click through rate. For example, one has maybe 1%, uh, the other one has 0, 5%, the other one has 4%. Now you know already, hey, I take the one with a um, objective um, uh, data. You know, it's not about which thumbnail you like the most. It's about hey, which thumbnail has the highest click-through rate conversion. And also, never, never use the thumbnails that are shown based on your video. Oh no! Always about a custom thumbnail. It's like if you don't do this, really, you're missing out. Close-ups work well. Use some curiosity because you curiosity is really what dra draws people in. It's like ah. Huh? What, what is that? I need to know what that is, you know? And so they click on it. So because then they cannot do anything because they're curious and then they need to resolve it and click on it. So sometimes it's a blurry line between clickbaity stuff, but clickbaity stuff still works. So try to do it in an ethical way. Have a nice uh, catchy title. If possible, of course, we artists uh, not always have like the, uh, we usually use our name, you know, artist name and then the title, uh, but still then focus on the thumbnail heavily. So this is really, really important. And this will help you to get more and more views and get suggested. So it's something small, but it's still huge. It's really, really important to, uh, yes, yeah, spend some time on your thumbnails. Yeah, no, I love that. It's just like emails, right? It, it, your subject line, the whole point of your subject mm -hmm. line is to get them to open it, yes. right? And yes. It, yes, it has to absolutely have to do with what you're talking about. It can't be just something that has nothing to do with your email. And same thing with your your thumbnail. It's got to have something to do with it, but it's got to pique your curiosity. Yeah. You have or, to cut through the noise, yeah. Yes, or it's got to be like exactly the thing that they've been looking, you know, they put in the search bar and they wanted this thing and it says exactly what they typed in that search bar, right? And they're like, yes. oh, this is for me. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, it's it's really crucial and yeah. 
We we always, like I said, use this Facebook hack, you know, just split test them. It can be done for five or 10 bucks, but it's really worth it in the long run. Yeah, yeah, it is. Because especially because when you put that video out, like you, it's important to get as many views on the front end, right? Like the, yes. you start churning that algorithm from the very minute that you put the video out, that's going to give you a lot better, um, you know, algorithmic push in YouTube. Yes, yes. And so the thumbnail is going to make a big difference on that. Absolutely. That's a great tip. I love it. Well, I, it's been so great to talk to you and, um, and, you know, just get all these strategies around YouTube because that is definitely not my, my specialty. <laughs> you know, I, I post on YouTube because I know it's important. I know hmm. that people are there. Um, but it is not where I have focused my time. Mm. So bringing someone on here that really knows the ins and outs and has had success on YouTube is really great. So thank you for helping our audience with all of that uh, information. So it, sure. is there, how can people connect with you outside of this podcast on, you know, where, your website and your, obviously your YouTube channel and your social media? So yeah, just uh, follow me on Instagram. It's like <laughs> my weird German name, Tobias.Rauscher. <laughs> Maybe you can put it somewhere. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, if you just look for Tobias Rauscher in German or Tobias Rauscher in English uh, on YouTube, you will find me there or check out um, fanbasepro.com. That's where we like help artists, mentor artists, if you're interested. Um, yeah, that's where you can find me. Or I have a website as well, Tobias minus or dash rauscher.com for the guitarists among you um that's what my music uh music uh how you call it music ego music thing <laughs> <laughs> so yeah check it out over there awesome we will put all of that in the show notes so you can always find that at profitable musician.com under our podcast area thank you so much tobias this has been so great i thank really you. appreciate you sharing all of your expertise and experience thank you so much for having me thanks for listening to the profitable musician show i would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.